Hi, folks. This is Christian Basil from Mark Who 42, and we want to thank you for listening and to ensure that we continue to bring the latest news, reviews, and interviews every single week here on Krypton Radio and on our website, www.markwho42.net. Please go now to GoFundMe and offer a one-time contribution to our show. Also, if you'd like, you can go to Patreon.com and contribute there as well. Go to www.markwho42.net and hit the donate donate button on the far right hand side contribute whatever you can give us so that we can bring you this show thank you again for everybody who contributes and thank you for listening hi there my name is phil nice i was in an episode of doctor who called kill the moon and you're listening to mark who 42 Welcome to Mark Who 42, that's right, Mark Who 42 here on Krypton Radio. I'm your host, Mark Baumgarten, and with me today are... Christian Basil. And Patty Hawkins. This week we are going to talk about the episode that went on 10 extra minutes. That was cool. It's called Heaven Sins. <laughs> it was cool. I, I enjoyed it. They didn't need those 10 extra minutes. I'm going to hey, say that right well, now. Well, we, you know, if you <laughs> got, I'm going to say that you, right, right now. But it was, it was nice to get to see Peter Capaldi do a monologue for almost an hour. That was kind of cool. And then later on in the program, if you remember, we were at some conventions in the last couple of weeks. We were at MegaCon Fan Days and Wizard World. And we have a report from Wizard World, Rito, given by our co-host. Eduardo M. Fryer and the other two here. We'll be talking about Megacon Fan Days. I'll just be basking in their glow. But first, let's get <laughs> basking in their glow. <laughs> well, it was a good convention, wasn't it? Okay. Yeah, so, I, I'm sure. I would. I, I would. Hey, I can tell you. Hey, I, 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 I challenge you. You interviewed Paul McGann. That was a surprise that we couldn't tell you about, folks. Christian <laughs> interviewed Paul McGann at the Q and A. Way to go, Christian. Yeah. Yay. Let's talk heaven sent. First of all, the elephant in the room, Clara. Wow. <laughs> That's a great description there. <laughs> No. All right. It, well, and, 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 anybody. That. Again, I, I I had several fears going to this episode, and um, I had no problem with his mental ghost that he created of her because he needed somebody to bounce his ideas off of, and he you know he kind of validates the, the the companion thing in the sense that even the doctor himself needs somebody to knock concepts off of, or for them to ask us dumb questions so he can explain it, and then that gives him an impetus for inspiration and be like, but wait, but if I try it like this, it'll do this, you know, Clara, you're a genius. Yeah, whatever. Exactly. Um, that I'm fine with. Um, the constant bemoaning about her and, and I'm, 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 I'm really, I'm really nervous that the remainder of this season and maybe even next season is going to be a constant lamenting over the loss of, of Clara and, I would almost rather she be back and alive and uh, yeah. gets, a ha- gets a happy ever after ending than for this to be like X Men after Jean Grey died, you know. Oh <laughs> my you god! Know? Yeah. Or, or 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 Ted Cord and and you know and Blue as Blue Beetle died, you know, or even when Barry Allen was dead for a while, it was just like okay, you guys never shut up about them ever. So or to put it in a more Doctor Who-ish short terms, you know after. Rose left Tenet's doctor and then, you know, Jen, just that kind of moping and bemoaning about. Oh, yeah. He treated Martha like sheep. Uh, yeah. nice. <laughs> nice. And we all love, he's like, you fool. She's worth 10 roses. Yeah. <laughs> so does that mean that Mickey beat the doctor in that one? Because <laughs> uh, the doctor yeah, ended up with Rose and Mickey got Martha. <laughs> Mickey won, and he deserved to. I have a question for you guys, and this was just a thought that came up when I was watching that episode, in particularly seeing the backside of Clara for that. What would you say if do you have you guys ever watched the series House? Yeah, yeah, I love the show. Okay, Patty. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I, I yeah. Go ahead, keep going. The Thank last you. episode, the very <laughs> last episode when I House is trapped. It. Oh, okay. I he's trapped. He's trapped. No, <laughs> you can go ahead though. Oh, okay. Yeah. Spoil Good. it. What do I Spoil care? it. Okay. Oh, for those of you. Um, House is trapped in a building that's on fire, and he's deciding whether he is going to get out of the place or he's going to let the fire consume him. And he has visions of his former companions, but not just former companions, companions who died. Uh-huh. And 
basically, you know, gave him a mental punch for each one of them that passed and affected him. And the only thing I could think of is something possibly similar happening here to where Rory and Amy, anybody who he kind of damaged on the way, coming in and, and doing that as opposed to just Clara being in the room. Then he's thinking about all the companions and all the damage because this is about confession. Well, the problem is Clara is so recent to him, or at least so recent to each copy of him, that that is who he's focusing on. If this had been weeks later, episodes later, he might have thought of other companions But this is so fresh in his mind, it made sense that Clara was there. What what would you think of the other companion? I almost wanted to throw in Adric and say, hey, I wanted him to feel the pain that he was suffering through, not only through Clara, but everybody else he damaged. And then everybody challenging him. But then it would have been a different story. It would would have been, you you wrote a different story just then. That would not have been what we watched. I gotta gotta, gotta go with with Mark on that one. These were all about pushing the doctor to, you know, reveal his his dark secrets, his own personal confessions. These were confessions, not necessarily acknowledgments of guilt, per se. Like, I, I could I could see, yeah, and it would be very valid for him to have a story about, you know, at the end where he's, you know, seeing, you know, ghosts of dead companions or whatever. It's like, you know, did I do right by you guys? Did I do wrong? You know, whatever. You know, again, we've talked about it before. Right. But if, if Tegan's daughter, you know, it's like, showed up, Tegan would, like, like drag her out of the TARDIS and, you know, don't come near my, me or my family or my children again. Right. Well, and, and Big Finish did bring Adric back post-explosion, bring, get rid of the dinosaurs and Adric was totally pissed at the doctor so I mean that story's already been told well know, again it, it, that, 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 it, gets, it gets an asterisk you know it's just like any, anything audio or novelization well this way I think Big Finish gets one asterisk novelizations get two asterisks okay so I got another layer of expanded universals and, and, and whatnot but to me the big telling thing was was when he refers to Clara as his best friend and I'm like and that, that was the, that was that was really the point where I was like oh, I thought Sarah was his best friend, Sir Jan Smith. Uh, I thought the brigadier was his best friend. He has a lot of best friends. He's lived a long time. He got a lot of best friends. I could, I personally, I mean, I understand you could is, you could interpret it in the greater context, but honestly, that one line and the veniality that he said it with to me, it was just, I was just like, no, Moffat, that's not the doctor's best friend. It was once again kind of shoehorning his pet into Doctor Who mythology, into Doctor Who greatness. And halfway through this, I I, I was reminded of uh, the recent big criticisms going on in the world of wrestling with the WWE about they're backing wrestling talent that they think should be popular, and it's not. And they're not letting the, the guys who organically are getting heat giving them any time or anything whatsoever. And the fans are going nuts. And I just I just feel like this this is the... This is the only thing I think Moffat has really been been gaffed on for the past season and a half. Is I, I just feel like, dude, you got to let this character go. I mean, she's popular, but she's not the end all be all. And I'm not saying that just because of my own issues or our own show's issues. I mean, we've seen it at our convention appearances we've done. I mean, Christian, you have always asked. I mean, it's like, who thinks it's time for Clara to go? And 80% of the room shoots its arms up. Wow. Yeah, wow. it's, it's it's just and not not just like recently. I mean, far far back as like summertime, people were good with her to go, but yeah. but M- Moffat just yeah, I I I don't I don't quite understand his own. I don't know if it's an agenda. I don't know if if it's just this, or I don't know if he's just maybe is just out of touch, and he really just thinks that the fans just love her so much that they want the show to be that much about her. I, I think he just had a lot riding on her for the time that she has been. And to cut her off at this point and not give her her swan song, it would be a disservice to her character. She has to be there at the big finale, and especially for this. Is this the final sliver that the Doctor has to endure of Clara? She's broken up all down his timelines, and we're going back to that old adage. I'm paraphrasing, but I'm born, I live, I save the Doctor, and then I die. So Mm -hmm. she went through the whole rigmarole of what she was supposed to do but it looks like there's a bigger apocalypse happening right at the doorstep of the well and again this Island. this season and this this nonsense about the hybrid which i i i find i find completely baffling i well, we'll, well we can get into that in the end let's, we'll let's, talk, more. let's talk more yeah. about this actual episode okay okay i, I, I actually have something i want to say go ahead did you guys notice when the doctor first notices that he's being watched on the monitor looking out the window and seeing the veil did you notice there was a 
poem that was written on the wall. I don't think I saw that. There is. is. There, there's, there's a poem on the wall. I, I, I have it here. As you come into the world, something else is born. You begin your life, and it begins a journey. Yeah, but didn't he read that poem at the beginning? He, yeah. Right, right. Oh, okay. Yeah, he right. said it at the beginning. Yeah. Tra- right. Wherever you go, whatever path you take, it will follow. You will notice a shadow next to you. Your life will then end. So he, he, that's the poem he said at the beginning. Well, it was on the wall, and I'm wondering, why was it on the wall? At that particular time and nowhere else. You know, you noticed it if you looked out of the corner of your eye, you could see it there. Do you have any ideas? Uh, I don't know. There's, there's, to the beginning of the season, there's been, or even last season, there was some weirdness too. I mean, uh, we still never really quite found out that whole thing under the bed from the previous season. No. I, I, I thought this, I thought this biz, that thing, whatever it was, you know, I thought it was like, it's like the shade creature that we caught a glimpse of last season but it's all chalky white like the watcher you know <laughs> and i mean maybe there was some deliberate like red herrings designed to fool the old timey fans and stuff because i mean you know halfway through i you know it's like i had half a dozen theories about what direction that this this was going into and i'm sure yeah. you guys did as well well like, i mean once he went into room 12 and i saw the the uh, the crystal the ice i totally knew where it was going okay I know what's behind there. The end. One thing I want to that we'd have to say. Let's talk about some good about this episode. Okay, yeah, yeah, please, because yeah. there was a lot of good. <laughs> There's absolutely a lot of good, and I'm sure people are. Oh, you guys are negative. All right, let me say no, this. No, no, we, right. this. Okay. A- a- everything that everybody has said that has raved about Capaldi's performance in this season and in this episode is 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 absolutely apropos. I mean, Capaldi is is setting a new standard in acting as far as doctors go, and that's not a, a bash against any of the previous doctors or anything on else. But um, I, I think whereas before, you know, a, a doctor was always measured by an incoming doctor would have to worry about his popularity. I think the next doctor is going to be all like. Um, yeah, Capaldi was an incredible actor, and filling in this roles is incredibly daunting, I, I think. It's not that the shoe, they're, they're big shoes to fill, now that they're going to be wider shoes. But yeah, I, absolutely, absolutely superb. Um, I didn't think I was going to like the whole, okay, create a duplicate of himself, and because I'm like, all right, that's that opens a, a, a door to some stuff that'll bite you in the ass later. But, oh, okay, so every transporter in the universe has a duplicate of somebody, and we can start doing Star Trek's transporter accidents, even Evil duplicates, yeah, you, know, you know, you know, Thomas Riker, perfect duplicate that doesn't know. <laughs> I, 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 bad, bad enough that as, as a time travel show, there's already some some issues that narratively may work for the immediate need, but in long term, I think is a big problem. Like for instance, I have a big, big, big effing problem with the Time Lord Society, a society based on the supreme mastery of time travel relying on something as banal as a prophecy i'm like uh ah, pro- prophecies work with primitive uh, primitive cultures and stuff that don't have time travel but you guys have time travel that's why you poked ahead saw the daleks were gonna uh, kill everybody and sent the doctor in genesis of the daleks but all right but we're talking about the good <laughs> stuff in the episode um i i i absolutely adored the notion of this diamond wall that a few molecules at a time was worn down through the erosion of the doctor's fists that was superb and amazing and i can see how some people were like when's this montage gonna end and even i was like but then halfway through i suddenly realized oh wait he's getting further and further and further into the brothers Grimm story indicating that he's each of these lives he gets a little deeper a little deeper a little deeper and yeah and and the context of yeah it would take a billion years of beating on this for about like 15 seconds increments it's hard sci-fi and i really quite enjoyed it um it was a great conceit so absolutely kudos to to mop and the writing staff for again something that an episode that i was like this is like 51 percent amazing and awesome and nine percent leaving me with 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 disturbing questions well the questions are disturbing well no this episode makes me want to know how this is going to all end oh yeah well we've had previous two parters that kind of info dumped and we're like uh well yeah i want to see how it goes now i'm like with this kind of it was more than an info dump it was bringing on what was going to happen and that he ends up eventually where he's supposed to be and then says his little 
thing about the hybrid. But I kind of thought, you know, it, it did throw me into uh, into a loop, and, and um, in some cases, you know, time loop. That's what I kept thinking after he started coming in, he, over and over and over and over again. The only continuity thing that a, a friend of mine brought up, or my friend uh, Catherine, she says everything resets itself but that diamond wall. Right, because that diamond wall wasn't part of the disc or whatever it right, was. Right, it, it was the it breakthrough. Was, it was the breakthrough. It was the crystal that in the 50th anniversary when he froze Gallifrey in time. That's what that was. Yes, right. we just spoiled the ending for you. Goodbye. <laughs> That's it. No, uh, uh. Well, no, I, I accepted it more because of what Patty said on the on the case that he ended up in the confession dial, that this right. was the confession dial trap, and that and he that was, was spouting out. out confessions. Yeah. So, cool. I mean, being that it's a piece of, I guess we can simply say, a Time Lord technology... Now it makes sense. And so the Time Lords basically hired a shoulder to capture the Doctor. We will probably know next episode. Probably. That, that, that could be the case because we know the Time Lords are going to be back on Gallifrey. Well, sure, sure, it sure nullifies the, you know, something we talked about last week. I was just like, hey, whatever happened to him fighting Gallifrey, you know? And, well, I think he just did. Yeah, well, I think they found we, him. We, first, might, we, we, we really don't know yet. Yeah. We and, don't and, know how this is ending. True. I just want to put a footnote in here. Am I the only one when Capaldi got the first time you see his burnt face? I was thinking Ricardo Montalban in Star Trek 2. I don't know why it reminded me of that, but it just I did. like that. I like that. I just remember burnt ah! face. Didn't notice, didn't notice, didn't notice uh, that per se. But uh, the very, the very, very first time we saw the burnt hand hit the ground and then disappear when he showed up, I had a pretty good idea where the that whole was... thing was going, and that was just in the what first thirty seconds. Yeah. Yeah. But because you heard it when he fell and you saw his hand disintegrate, you actually heard his voice in pain. And already I was thinking time loop is already started. That's where I got the time loop yeah. idea because he lands. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, God, I can see where this is going. He's going to be trapped in the time loop. And then hopefully he'll eventually figure it out, which in a sense he did. It took him about 25 minutes to figure out that he was going to have to do everything over and over and over again. I was still getting freaked out by the pool of skulls. <laughs> just imagining if you went swimming in an ocean all of a sudden you saw skulls and you found out that each one of these thousands of skulls is you again and again and again and also the fact that he wanted to lose didn't he just lose in sleep no more <laughs> he well to, again i did i just I did, got to lose. wanted to give up Maybe, he but I, give yeah I, I and i did appreciate that this the the doctor wanted to kind of lay down his burdens you know and again too it's not that he was going to but it was literally that, you know, why can't I just be fat and lazy like everybody else? And why can't I just, you know. So uh, it's to lose and to lose is to win. He had to die several probably million times to win. <laughs> right. And, and I, I, again, one good thing that they're really doing this season is that they're really, again, they're establishing the way the doctor is hyper intelligent as mm-hmm. opposed to just a regular sentient being like you or me, you know, just better educated. I mean, all that stuff he was doing with the storm room. Yes. The story, the leaves and the chair and the measuring and the computations. And all I need to do is just when the sun goes down and I see the stars and I'll know exactly when I am and where I am. Right. That is the doctor that I could never hope to be, or I think a, a, a person could ever hope to be as yeah. Clara found out last week definitely so patrick you were telling me before off air what you thought of the environment that the doctor was trapped in the the confession dial yeah i think there's a lot of shades of the gallifreyan matrix yeah um which was the matrix before the movie the matrix uh (laughs) (laughs) it was It kind of was. Um, I, I I won't call it the earliest form of, of cyberpunk, but uh. um, it was really early. I mean, Deadly Assassin was, was what, uh, mid-late 76. 70s? 76. Yeah, that's, that's pretty w- yeah. heavy stuff. That's pretty heavy it stuff. Star Wars, and yet it had the Star Wars thing at the beginning. Yeah, the scroll. Titles, yeah, it was before Star Wars. Yeah, and um, and that was another tip off for me. I thought, okay, this, this, I think this is something Gallifrey and the next step because I was pretty sure he was in some kind of virtual reality, Never Never Land, and I think even he himself probably suspected it. But again, he was he was he was playing the game. But I'll tell you one thing: when he was digging up that grave. 
and brushing away. <laughs> and Christian and I talked about this again last week. I thought there was going to be the the mirror there with the clown that's going to be laughing at him. <laughs> and then I yeah, thought, okay. and then I and then I thought he was going to go up and it's like, oh, I'm in the Matrix. I'm in that Galifian Matrix, aren't I? You know, and my body is plugged in somewhere, and I'm back in here. You know, and... for a second I thought he was digging his own grave. Uh... Yeah, I, I, it was. It was really, yeah. And and to a certain extent, um, peripherally, yeah, he kind of was, or a variant of the the Galifian Matrix, and. Um, for those of you that haven't seen the original classic story, The Deadly Assassin, that's one of my recommended for non-classic fans lists. Because And very similar to this one until it's the Doctor on his own without a companion. He has allies and people helping him along, but he has no companion in either of these stories. So in a weird way, I, 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 I kept thinking that even at the very end, I was just like, I'm... I'm curious if in a few weeks somebody's going to ask Moff, I'd be like, oh yeah, this is kind of my dedication to Deadly Assassin. This episode, but Capaldi was great. Did we really need this? Uh, and again, it sounds like bashing, and I don't want to Clara bash. Did we need the scene where Clara actually talks to the Doctor? Was that the selling point, you know, to have her in it? But it was an important message that he had to hear from her. But did we need to see her in flesh or matrixy flesh? As the case. Yes. Or from behind, not really her. Yeah, because I mean, the yeah. back was I, all I right. Kinda, I kind of wonder if that was, it was really like Jenna or it was just a, yeah. a, a stand in for her that day. I thought that was just like a dummy, a shop dummy with her clothes on it. And then, <laughs> and then she was actually in it. If that was her, then they had to pay her. Here's yeah. the thing he kept going up towards behind her and i was waiting for the moment at one point where he goes right up close to her and waiting for her to turn around and it was going to be the veil or something coming up against him and 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 then boom right back to the scene where the veil is about to attack him again remind him hey by the way you're in you're in this trap i want to get out but yeah i think for this particular moment claire worked yeah. We had to see her. We had to say something because it reminded me of the moment where she's in the Day of the Doctor and she's talking to the 11th Doctor and said, be who you're supposed to be. Be the Doctor. Surprising for all the listeners out there, I think that she definitely had to be there too. I, I think that was important. I agree. Just like last episode, her speech, yeah, melodramatic as it was, it was her character. It fit in this. Clef, okay. I can't yeah. bash her anymore. No, no I, I, I concur. I'm, I'm reminded a little bit of the Peter O'Toole movie, My Favorite Year. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Where, where, the, where the character of Benji gives the speech at the end. It was just like, like, like so what if the, this, 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 this Errol Flynn character of yours was phony right. and make-believe? It worked. And I think that's, that's kind of what Clara Job has been. The Doctor is always, and this is the kind of neat thing, too. It just goes back to, no, no, my name, it's a promise. Like, when he right. started to call himself the Doctor, he set himself on this path, which he's been striving for, but may not necessarily 100% be him, as opposed to, like, something that he's trying to be, and always trying to be, and always, and somebody's got to check himself. And she being kind of the ultimate Doctor fan of all the good, all of his good deeds. I mean, yeah, she has kind of reminded him, no, 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 you are the Doctor. And he's almost like he's saying, no, no, I just call myself the Doctor. And she's like, no, you are the Doctor. You really are. And and yes, narratively, it's working. It's uh, redeeming your character um, a lot. Again, a lot of the gripes that I previously had. I think you're, anybody is an absolute idiot if they we think that we're, we're done with her. I'm sure she's going to be back in the oh, flesh no. next episode. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, and, there's even a line in the trailer that makes you think that it has something to do with bringing her back. Yeah. In the next episode, oh boy, because this is not this is not the first time that the the Time Lord's machinations with messing with the Doctor have cost him, you know, a companion. Um, yeah. You know, the death of of Perry. You know, because mm -hmm. he was pulled away and and what. But she didn't die. She married. King Arachnus. But he didn't together. know that. That was in the beginning. Oh, I mean, remember. Perry alive? Yes. Uh, <laughs> but again, Colin Baker was like, you killed Perry, you know? And, and 
Uh, yes, but that was but that was a Valyard using that as a weapon against the Doctor. He knew he was going to get emotional. He knew. Uh, let's not talk about knew. the Valyard. That's an unexploded mm. bomb. Nobody should touch. Me. Right. <laughs> but they, but but it's going by what you're saying. The Time Lords. No, no, no. I, I, you're screwed absolutely, with. You're them absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And 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 already the, there's the preview shot of him with the glasses and his guitar marching to Gallifrey. And who knows? I think after this season finale, I, I wouldn't doubt at all if there's going to be. Uh, I won't say a restructuring but I, I, I think things are going to be kind of reset maybe for the next several years. I think, okay, I think at the end of this, we're going to know exactly the doctor's status, what his status with Gallifrey is or if it exists or whatever, if he's going to be on the run from them because they're chasing him or he's going to be right. on the run because they want him to be the leader again, you know. And, and, uh, and, and let me put right here this thing. Has Moffat finally committed hubris i don't think i don't i i I, he's he's getting he's he's getting close to the edge i think any any time any showrunner has has thrown the doctor back to gallifrey every time the doctor goes back to gallifrey or does something directly with the time lords right i feel it dilutes the whole mythology less is always more when it comes to the doctor's past and again, the Cartmel plan, I think, was a step in the right direction. And I really wish that would be at least acknowledged or looked upon or whatever to a certain degree. But the but the but the fact, fact of the matter is, is that I think I think Moffat wants Moffat wants to get in and tell all the stories that he can with, with Gallifrey, but I'm just I'm just I'm just a little nervous because you know, every time we, we I mean a little more back. You know, the fact that we now know definitely the truth, supposedly, the truth. The doctor did not leave Gallifrey because he was bored. He left because he was scared because he is the hybrid. Yeah, and again, this hybrid thing was something that was popped in. You no, know, no, this... no, it may not have been just popped in. He may be going back to Paul McGann, the TV movie, that he's half human on his Yeah, mind. I was thinking that. The two <laughs> warrior races, Gallifrey and Earth. That makes sense. Half human, half Gallifreyan. That was already kind of established, kind of written out by all the fans, but it looks like Moffat has brought it back in. Well, I, I want to say I did read somewhere that, 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 that Moffat absolutely hates that idea. Well, then, now, again, we know, Moffat, we know Moffat lies, too. So. Yeah. Yeah, he, I, he, he, I, Virgin I, Books actually explains it. I don't know how they did it, but they explained it that he was in disguise. I don't remember that, but they, they tried to write either. Virgin Books tried to write it off about the half human thing because uh, that was yeah again the book thing. two asterisks but, yeah well, yeah it's off. but it's still you know could he be owning up to it can he say you know what we've been having this little bad taste in our mouth let's let's go for it yeah so showing most... you, I, I mean he's got to have some pride as to what he's doing I mean take it for what you will if you like or dislike Moffat the man we all love to hate however knows what's going on he was a big fan just as big as RTD was. And he knows the stories, but I, I, I side with Andrew Cartmill on this. Do not go any further than the doorway of Gallifrey when, we ex- when we're explaining the Doctor. I'm hoping he understands that. We can go and dip and nip into it like they did in Lungborough. We'll yeah. dip into it, we'll, we'll, but we will not give too much because once we've explained the Doctor, it is no longer Doctor Who. We know who the Doctor is. The, uh, exactly. the show's it's over. over. Yeah. It's so, all over. It is, it, I, I was talking just today with a, with a friend of mine, and... Uh, and I, I, a metaphor I used uh, in comics was everybody who gets in charge of Batman, whether it's in the comics or in a, in a movie or a media, everybody seems to fester to want to give a new reason as to why Batman's parents were killed. And I'm like, Batman works best when it, his parents are killed by a random mugger and right. nothing else. Right. No conspiracies, no Jack Fair when he was younger, no, oh, well, you know, Bruce's parents were getting close to discovering our money laundering ring or whatever. No, nothing. Because... Batman's war is against crime, not yeah. the criminals. And and yeah, again, it's 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 dilution. I know you're okay. having a problem with Gotham. I can tell. <laughs> I, 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 I I I don't I don't. Well, we can we can entertain some ideas. I think we have to delve into something of his character and his nature to find out to give him more depth. As I'm far okay as with discovering his characteristics. I'm okay with things like. Again, like, 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 my title is a promise that for reasons I won't discuss about this or whatever, I'm okay with that. Um, I don't want flashbacks. I don't want explanations. I don't want to, I, I never want to meet his wife. I never want to meet but, his parents. I never want to 
I, you know, I, I almost quit the show like last season, the whole Clara being under his bed uh, thing. I mean, well, I mean, like what they did in, in the 25th anniversary for Silver Nemesis, they only delve into it. They mentioned the weapon. They mentioned why it was built, but they never really found out with the discovery. And maybe later on explain it, but not necessarily give all the information, give it out to the audience to the point where we know his core we know everything about him, but we can entertain the idea. Cause yeah, because remember, remember too, when you peel away that layer of the onion, there's the next guy is going to come on in or yeah. or Cal, and they're eventually going to want to go back to the well too, and eventually that well is going to get dry, and right. then all that's well, left is a hard reboot. Well, we're going to start with the first Doctor, and he's going to leave Gallifrey in search of his lost father, and uh, you know, no, you know. And that's a good point, but it also once you've put the lock in. It's locked in. That's his persona. That's his character. We can't go around and, and, and mosey around it. We we could probably moff it our way on, if I can make that as a, as a noun now. But no, if you're going to moff it your way out, that's the first. If moff it your way out of something. Here's, but... here, here's, here's what it all boils down to. If there's a really, really, really good reason for, for going in this direction, that's fine. I just – I don't want – Doctor and Gallifrey stories and everything else to be used for a cheap pop. I, I don't want it to be a – Oh wow, this is uh, super awesome and exciting right now, and so and then, but, but again, we have long term continuity problems and canical problems, and the attitude is, ah, well, the next guy is, or ah, oh, it's just a TV show, who cares or whatever. It's like, yes, I've ex- I have accepted that there's lots of facets of Doctor Who continuity that you just no no just just put your hand down, stop asking these questions. Okay, you, you got to let it go, but there are some other things to character that I, 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 I think, yeah, I, I just, mm, I don't know. It's dangerous. It's a dangerous tightrope. I believe Moffat can do it. I absolutely believe Moffat is talented enough to do it. I absolutely think he can do it, mm-hmm. but, um, but man, he's, he's, he's plays playing with fire. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. I totally understand. And that is a very dangerous type rope to walk as Andrew has said. And if you don't keep him, hit the mysterious doctor then show over okay guys real quick what was your favorite part what was your worst part of the episode christian i think for the most part seeing capaldi by himself seeing what a terrific actor he is seeing the love and devotion he has as his first character seeing actually moffat as a writer writing for capaldi's character and even rachel talele directing the whole thing I mean, this this episode blew my mind completely, and I, it was very enjoyable. It was it was a wonderful take on his doctor. I'm not the only one. I was reading some of the blogs, and he's getting critical acclaim. Not only is Capaldi, but Moffat and Rachel for doing a great job directing this episode. It is a very wonderful episode. It makes me want to know what happened next, as opposed to uh, the, you know, this was info dump, and you know. Okay, I'm hoping that the second episode. I I can't praise it anymore. I, I I'm actually even going to say this. It's not only I think one of the best episodes of the new series. I think it's probably one of the best for me. The top five episodes, if not the top three of all time. Okay, cool. And you, Mark? Again, like Christian said, Peter Capaldi's acting chops were amazing. I just loved it, and I liked the fact that the story. I, I kind of go that this was kind of like Groundhog Day mashed with the seventh seal. Yeah. I saw Igbar Bergman having something to do with this. Patty? Uh, by far it's 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 it, it was it was a, it was a treat to see again a lot of shades of uh, of Deadly Assassin where the doctor was was on his own and even talking to a pseudo uh companion. It was still largely his own adventure, and I'm hoping that that the, that the claim that this is getting might set this up to see more of these. I, I think I think every I think every doctor should have an adventure like this from this point going forward, and, and I'm hoping that kind of similar to like other episodes, the way they lock into uh, that. Uh, I'm hoping that the next doctor will get uh, a story like this, and the doctor after that, doctor after that, because um, I think there's gold in them. Their hills, not necessarily with revealing and stuff, but really just saying, okay, as an actor, as a director, and we're just going to have them in a tight environment and go and deal with the resourcefulness that is the doctor and the innovation and the brilliance. The part I probably liked the least actually didn't have much to do with the episode. It was, I think, seeing all of 
fandom gush a little too much about this one. People calling it the, 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 the greatest episode ever. Although they are shutting up about Blink right now. So maybe I could be wrong. <laughs> you know what? I Scratch that. Uh, everything's fine. We'll see you next week. Okay. Well, pa- well, Patty, I, I'm at, look, if I can add this on to it, I think this paid homage to what's all good about Doctor Who as far as the writing and the acting is concerned. I think everything I, I from agree. like I, this, 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 this definitely, yes, uh, this, like, this, like this. Deadly, Deadly Assassin, Genesis of the Daleks, everything that is good, everything that actually challenges the Doctor, encompassed in this episode. Now, I'm, I'm not fangirling because you know everybody else is saying it. I'm fangirling because it is. This showed Capaldi. This showed his Doctor. I've never seen it anywhere else in any episode as strong as this one. Well, guys, I think that's about all the time we have for this review and talk of Heaven Sent. We're going to go to a commercial break. When we come back, we will have footage from Wizard World Reno, and we'll talk a little about Megacon Fan Days. It just happened two weeks ago. We'll be right back here on Krypton Radio. The voice of Christian Basil, take one. Hi, I'm Christian Basil, and I would like to provide my voice for all your voiceover needs, such as... Okay, like an announcer. Like a what? Like an announcer. For all your voiceover needs, such as animation, radio, announcements, introductions... Now an old man. I can even record voicemail for all the mashuganas that call you. A pirate. Arr, and it won't cost you a lot of treasure for me services. Arr. Creepy movie voice. Just call 407-761-2679. 407-761-2679 or email voice of Christian Basil at yahoo.com. Well, how was that? That's a wrap. Remote Control is the new TV podcast from the GeekCast Radio Network. We'll be covering TV shows and topics from the year 2000 to whenever now is. We'll have special themed episodes entitled Pilot and Season Premieres, as well as Finishing Finales. We'll also have Season Pass episodes, where we take a look at an entire season of a TV show. Remote Control can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and www.geekcastradio.com. So tune in, because we are all remote controlled. Attention all Whovians! While you're waiting for the new episode of Doctor Who, start your own adventures with a book from Mark Who 42 Books. They carry unique and rare books at affordable prices. Visit Amazon.com slash shops slash Mark Who 42. That's Amazon.com slash shops slash Mark Who 42. Mark Who 42 Books. Set your imagination free into the Hooniverse. Kid? Yes. Shut up. Beyond the Night is the GCRN's latest review podcast. We are covering everything in the Knight Rider television universe. From the classic 80s TV series to the 1991 reunion film, Team Knight Rider, ugh, and the 2008 relaunch series as well. So join TF2 and Mike and Dion the Music Man as they go in depth in Beyond the Night only on Geekcast Radio Network. You can find Beyond the Night in iTunes and on www.geekcastradio.com. Dot com. Good. Yes, Michael. Just keep driving. Hi, folks. This is Christian Basil, Mark Who 42. And if you've been lucky enough to catch us at conventions and wondered how you could hire us to come to your convention or special event, simply go to Heroes on Hand, click the podcast icon and click the icon for mark who 42 on our page on heroes on hand you can actually click the button that says click here to book more who 42 for your next event and that's all you have to do once again if you want to hire us for your next event simply go to heroesonhand.com click on podcast click on our icon and click the green button to book us for your next event you're gonna love us we'll see you there my name is Jim Shooter, former editor-in-chief of Marvel, uh, also Valiant in other places. And I have to say, Mark Who at 42 is great. And we're back here on Mark Who 42 here on Krypton Radio. I'm your host, Mark Baumgarten. We've got Christian Basil and Patty Hawkins here with me. And we're going to be talking a little bit about these conventions that we just did. A little self-promotion in the past. I guess that would be saying how good we did, right? So how good did we do at Megacon Fan Days, guys? Uh, Megacon Fan Days was a, a, an absolute uh, delight. Uh, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a smaller convention. It was the first time. It was an offshoot of uh, we're calling uh, regular Megacon, which is held traditionally in the spring. Mm-hmm. And, um, and as I said, we, we, we interviewed Christine recently. And I think for a first time, brand new convention without the usual uh, 
uh, heads up as it is. I, I think it did well. But this way, it did great for us at Marco 42. <laughs> and it did pretty solid for my other uh, for, uh, venue with the uh, Geeks of Comedy. So oh, I... Yeah. I, I have, yeah, we, we, we had solid houses for both our Doctor Who panels, and we had a great full house uh, for Geeks Comedy, so yeah, I, I had a good old time. And how did Match Game go? Because I, I, I hear that... It was... That it, match it was Game was a delight. Yeah. I'll be honest, and again, this, Christian, I have to give you credit, um, I, I was, I was, I had a lot of concerns about this. I was like, I don't think this is gonna work. I, I really didn't, <laughs> but you know, dude, you, you set it up. You delivered, you you got in some great, great local Doctor Who pundits. Um, Can you I got thank six, Nicholas uh, Roche uh, for getting the sound effects and the electronics Nick, and stuff? Nick was, Nick was fantastic. Um, like I said, we had uh, John Reed Adams, who is now part of the Mark Who 42 family. Yeah, he, um, he writes feature articles for our website, yeah. Yes, he is, and he is he is cosplayer prime for uh, Paul McGann cosplay. <laughs> uh, we had uh, we had Jezebel, uh, who's I, I've known in cosplay circles for a while now, and she was hysterical. We had good shows. We we had a good time. Um, Christian, of course, yeah, uh, you just had me laughing nonstop. So he was <laughs> it was our Charles Nelson Riley. No oh, wow! I I'm I'm gonna give kudos to Pat because if it wasn't for had out there hosting the show as Gene Rayburn, if not 2.0. It was he was. I mean, he he made me laugh in in, in retrospect to what was going on out there. It was total hilarious. I think I thought Patty was awesome as a host. We could not get anybody any better. I'm not. I'm not just kissing his rear. I mean, he was <laughs> awesome. I mean, he kept everything in line. We had a little bit of a technical thing, and it was just you know, it was uh, semantics. That was all it was. And everybody had a great time. They were laughing their ears off. I, even Jezebel, I mean, she was coming up to me and goes, I don't know much about Doctor Who. I said, Jezebel, you just answer the way you want to. And I think she was running out of meat products every answer that she had out there. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it was a good time all around, and e- even so, I think everybody. What, and was, and, and c- c- who else was on our panel there? Uh, Kayla, had, uh, Kayla, Kayla, how'd Kayla do? Kayla did awesome. Uh, we also had a friend who was the girl in the fireplace, uh, Kara Nielsen. Oh. Uh, and we also had Lynn and and uh, John, and it was just. Everybody walked out of there. Everybody who was not familiar with the game, our panelists, who were a little bit, you know, who just were off the cuff learning how the match game worked. They said they want to come back and do it again. So. Lynn looked great, by the way, as uh, Jessica Jones cosplay. And wow. uh, well, we, we'll we'll probably need to when things calm down. We'll have to we'll have to do a, um, a David Tennant uh, Jessica Jones thing because. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, we definitely have to. There's a, there's some interesting stuff uh, in, going on right there about because I made a joke a few weeks ago about oh I guess all the David Tennant cosplayers are shopping for a purple, purple jacket and some people are saying that no given the purple man's uh, antics as we'll call it in Jessica Jones is that a valid or proper cosplay and oh yeah. come on how can it not be valid yeah, cosplay? you 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 uh, dude this th- wait we'll have to talk about this in a later episode right, we'll, trust, we'll bring this up in a later. there's there's a big brewing controversy about this right now but anyway and uh but yeah and our and our bash game went great i'm loving jessica jones i mean it's a great show and we will talk about this on another episode because david Tennant deserves it you know what i i have an idea we've talked a little about megacon but our west coast contingent did do wizard world and ed has a report from wizard world eduardo m fryer uh should i play it for everybody absolutely yeah so here's ed at wizard world reno This is Eduardo M. Fryer, and you are now listening to the very first interview that Marku42 is doing at Wizard World Reno 2015. And we have a doozy. Sitting here in front of me is the one, the only, the man who did the time warp again, Barry Boswick. Good evening, sir. Good evening. How are you? You know, I never actually learned the time warp. My character, Brad Majors, actually was on the sidelines watching everybody else do it. And I said, 
say at the end of the scene, I say, does anybody know how to Madison? So I sort of uh, since then have learned how to Madison. But whenever I'm asked to, to go up and do the time warp, I go, oh, is it a jump to the right or a jump to the left? I don't remember. I don't. <laughs> well, fortunately, you did your time on Spin City. Yeah. Fortunately, it didn't seem like you were asked to time warp that much. No, no, because that was a very modern show. I will be time warping on that if and when we ever do a reunion show. I mean, those shows always, you always do a reunion show 15 or 20 years later. Well, there's also the times where you have entertainment magazines and it's like, Spin City Reunion, and they all get you for the group photo. Yeah, well, we just did that for Rocky Horror on Entertainment Weekly. We just did a cover show. I actually saw that. Before the photo shoot, were you ever in touch with any of your co-stars, like Susan Sarandon or Tim Curry? Oh, yeah. I see Susan occasionally at at openings and things. She's pretty busy, and Tim, because of his illness, because he had a stroke and he was... He's sort of pretty much wheelchair bound and homebound, and so I don't didn't, haven't seen him a lot since his, since his stroke. But it was great to see him that day because that was it was to see that he's mending, you know. Yeah, because I was going to say I heard about his stroke, and you know he did look like he had been through a lot. But when you saw him, he seemed to be recovering. He seemed to be doing, for lack of a better term, okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he'll ever get out of the chair. Unfortunately, I, I don't think he'll ever be able to get full movement back. He's got help 24 hours a day, and it was very nostalgic when we were all together for that photograph for Entertainment Weekly because it was wonderful to see him and sad to see him at the same time yeah. because he's such a strong, large presence in the world as an actor and as a human being and his wit and his sense of humor. He hasn't lost that. It's just his ability to get up and be a Frankenfurter. Going from Rocky Horror, we at Marku 42, myself especially, we do have a soft spot for one of your less, let's say, less prominent works. Megaforce. Ye- you read my mind. <laughs> yes, Megaforce. Mega- amazing Megaforce. In 1980, what, three or something? Um, 80, 82, 82 like 82. early 80s. Yeah, yeah. It, it's become like this cult movie. I, I uh, when I do these uh, these conventions occasionally, it's, if people don't know me from Rocky Horror or Spin City, it's always the guy who comes up and says, "I saw you when I was ten years old. I made my bicycle look like one of your motorcycles shooting rockets." <laughs> oh my god! You know, and I and I go, "Do you have any of the toys?" Because <laughs> I would like to get my hands yeah, I on heard, some. Did, of was it wasn't it Matchbox or something that came that came out with the toys? Very very limited edition. Oh jeez, yeah. I, I check eBay, you know, every oh, month to try to get my hands oh, on God. some of the toys. And how have you found any? No, I haven't found not, any. Not even not even finding the motorcycle, but for like a thousand bucks. Oh, no, no, oh it's God! Become such a collector's item. Well, you know what? I will do you a favor. As I'm running around the con this weekend, if I see somebody has Megaforce, oh God! If, if I if I can't get a hold of it myself. I'll be like, this is what you need to do. Send one of your people behind the table to Barry Boswick's table. Yes. Let him know because he's looking for it. Thank now, um, one question, though. Yeah. Do you still remember the iconic line? Uh, it's, um, the good guys always win, even in the 80s. Yes. There you yes. go. You that's see? awesome. Well, it's still, it's still getting around in YouTube. Yeah. Do you think that's true today in the 2000s? Oh, yeah. You got to be. I mean, sure, good guys always win. Doesn't make any difference when it is. You know, if you're a, are you a good guy? I like to think so. Yes, uh, you look like a good. Guy. Oh, th- thank you, thank you. There you go. See anybody listening? If you doubt how much of a good guy I am, the guy from Megaforce says I'm a good guy. If yeah, you can't, yeah. if you can't trust him, who can you trust? And here's what I'm. Do- I, they can't see it because it's radio. But I'm going to kiss my thumb and give you the the, the thumbs up because at, oh, at the end of the God. movie, um, Ace Hunter did that. So that's like the iconic move. If got- you know, if you know the movie, yeah. I got the Ace Hunter thumbs up. My life is complete. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Enjoy the con. Thank Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. After the awesomeness of talking to Barry Boswick and seeing that he has absolutely no problems doing Megaforce, we're going to follow this up. I am here with Chris51 from Epic Inc., but we're not going to exactly talk about Inc., but Chris51 is a fellow soul when it comes to the awesomeness of Star Wars. So I'm calling you out now, Mark, okay, and you, Patty, okay? You're a great couple of guys. It's awesome recording with you guys, but you know what? Chris and I, we are going to team up, and we are going to 
break your Star Wars cynicism. Now, Chris, let my showrunner and my fellow co-host, let them know how jazzed are you for the fact that in one month, Star Wars is going to be back on the big screen. Well, let me see here. Mark and Patty, i got a bone to pick with you guys, okay, because this is the most monumental day. This day will go down in history of pop culture. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's a national holiday, and it will become a national holiday every year, just like May the 4th, all that stuff. This is going to be a holiday every year. You watch and see. But just the fact alone of what J.J. Abrams did for the Star Trek series, turning that completely around, revamping it and making it what it was, and being able to bring in fans that didn't have to be Star Trek fans or know anything about Star Trek and have them love these movies. If he could bring 1% of that to Star Wars with already the fan base that there is and bringing in new fans and new generations into it and stuff, and if he doesn't put Jar Jar Binks in it, you'd be a fool to not expect it to be the the best-selling movie of all times. Well, there you go. I know that with Mark, the problem is he still feels the sting of the prequels, which is understandable. We all do. Yeah, we all feel that sting for sure. Okay. And what do you say to him? Why should he maybe feel differently with this? I've told him it's because, well, from all the teasers that we've seen and from all the interviews, it's clear Abrams is a fan and he's not going to do anything that will upset the fans. Exactly. Well, first of all, you have much better writers. Okay. Plain and simple, much better writers. We've all learned from the mistakes. But what I think, to me personally, is the most crucial element about the new movies compared to the prequels is the fact that they got away from all the CGI and they went back to real models. They went back to the formula that works and have stood the test of time. And they're building life-size Millennium Falcons. They're building life-size X-Wings. They're shooting on locations all around the world. The fact that they're doing this and they're going back to that original formula, that in itself shows that there's more heart and soul into this than the prequels. Exactly. And I do know Mr. Hawkins is not happy with what Abrams did with Star Trek. And while I will admit I have my own issues with Into Darkness, I generally thought he did a decent job. So what do you say to those who are like, well, Abrams ruined Star Trek by, you know, making it pure action. How can I trust him with Star Wars? What do you say to them? I can say this. Okay, Star Wars is pure action. It always has been. It's an epic saga of action. Where I've always I've always said, uh, and I love both Star Trek and Star Wars, okay, but I've always said that Star Trek is the brains and Star Wars is the brawn. You got the beauty and the beast, okay? Yes, there was a lot of action in Star Trek, but you know what? In this day and age, I- I'm a Star Trek purist, all right? I love it. I love it all. But I had an open mind to the movie because I understand, being in the entertainment business, that this day and age, you are not going to draw a crowd if you don't have action. The old Star Trek formula does not work anymore. Not with what society is used to with all these blockbuster huge movies out today. It just wouldn't work. It would work for TV, yes, but it won't work for theaters. It just can't work, okay? People expect more. People want more. So that was a necessity for me. And the fact that he changed the storyline and plot and kind of made his own time frame, I liked it. To me, that was the best way to try and please the most amount of people. Well, the thing that I like is that love or hate what he did he went out of his way to say that this is a separate universe and that he wasn't kind of reinventing the wheel it's like anybody who likes the original series anybody who likes the original movies they're still there exactly. it's not like they got totally wiped out yeah exactly that's exactly what he did you know and he grew up a star wars fan so he tried to make him a little more star warsy and oh well who doesn't like that i love it so it is what it is there you have it folks chris 51 from epic inc he's on my side star wars 7 is going to be awesome Iggy, Star Wars 7 is going to be awesome? Quite possibly, yeah. you got to be more enthusiastic than that, Iggy. Help me out here. J.J. Abrams did, okay? If okay. he messes up, it's Jar Jar Abrams. Okay. But think about it this way. How much did you fangirl out when you see the trailers? I'm only going to do this once, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, anybody whose glasses or windows broke listening to that, I apologize. But do you see this? The legions that are excited for Star Wars are exactly that, legions. So, Mark and Patty, you're going to have to deal with it. And listeners, make a note, when the movie rocks, I am not going to be quiet about it. So, coming soon to Marku 42, the Star Wars Episode 7 Victory Lap. Okay, ladies and gentlemen and Whovians all alike. So after the fun of the press junket and talking to the awesome Barry Boswick and incredible Star Wars fan Chris 51, I've decided let's start the first day at con. Let's pay a little homage to the local artists. Therefore, I am here with local author Russell R.S. Archie. Good afternoon, Russell. How you doing? All right, sir. Pretty excited. How are you? I'm doing fine. For those of you who are Warhammer fans, Russell has decided 
decided, in order to pass the time between visits, to work on some model work. What are you working on there, Russell? Uh, right now I'm painting a Dark Talon. It came in the starter sets when I first got started, and I'm just now getting around to painting it. And uh, since it's mostly black, it'll be easy to fill in while I'm sitting here in between people walking by. And you were telling me the reason that you are doing this is so that you have something to do so you're not just staring out into the crowd. Yeah, I, uh, this is the second Wizard World I've been to in Reno, and since I've finished these books, in between right and others, I've started visiting conventions and just touting the ones I have. And, you know, I talk to people as they go by and everything, but it's, sometimes I kind of feel like a creeper whenever I just sit there and seem like I'm staring at people walking by and everything. So I just got something to where I don't just have my head down in, like, another book to read or something. But at the same time, you know, I have something to keep my hands busy because I'm a twitchy little person. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, the two books that you have, Crucible, Sanitarium, it looks like you dabble mostly in horror. That's what I've written a lot of here lately. And fantasy was what I first started writing in. Sanitarium is actually a, a magazine, and this is the 38th issue of their magazine. I just I bought some copies to sell here because one of my new stories is featured in it. It's, I believe, their newest issue, and Crucible is the first short story series that I started writing just to test out the self-publishing stuff. Now, we had a chance to talk at the Great Basin Geek Con, and it wasn't Crucible Vampire Stories? It was because I started off writing it. It was actually kicked into gear because I was just kind of tired of seeing a lot of the stuff that was happening with vampires. I, I like the scary... Yeah. So no vampires. no sparkling? No sparkling, for God's sakes, no. no. Barely even the Victorian area type. These are more the uh, old-school, eat-your-face vampires. Nice. Okay, well, there you heard it here, folks. If you want some old-school, scary vampires who are not emo and sparkling, then pick up R.S. Archie's book, Crucible. Where can they pick up your books? They're for sale in digital and paperback on Amazon, and I will probably be putting them on barnesandnoble.com shortly, too. There you have it. You guys like what you hear? Go to Barnes & Noble. Go to Amazon. Buy his books. This is a wonderful guy. We need to support his Warhammer habit. Yes, please. The more money I have, the more I have to waste on this hobby. Now we are talking to Marvel artist Danny Fingeroff. How you doing? Okay. Well, Marvel writer and editor. Okay. Writer, editor, but yeah. Marvel superstar Danny Fingeroff. Well, of course. That's superstar. Yes, there of course. Go. That and a uh, Metro card will get me into the New York subway. <laughs> well, hey, if there was a long line, I'd let you cut in front of me. I appreciate that. Now, the show that I work for, uh, Marco 42, at the same time Wizard World is going on, part of our crew is in Florida actually hosting panels at Megacon in Orlando, and you're actually doing some panel hosting yourself this weekend, aren't you? I am. I work with Wizard. I'm a uh, programming consultant, which means a fancy way of saying that I organize and moderate panels at most of their shows, including this one in Reno. Today, I'm doing panels with Jim Shooter and Nikki Wheeler-Nicholson and John Boy Myers and uh, Phil Ortiz of The Simpsons and lots and lots of cool folks talking about comic book history, Marvel history, what it's like to be an artist, how to draw, how to write. So, yeah, that's, you know, it's kind of a potpourri of... Uh, things. And those are just my panel. There's other panels, but of course, mine are the ones. Well, yours are the awesome one. Well, mine's are more awesome. The others are awesome, too. <laughs> well, well, hey, you're going to be sharing the stage with the legendary Jim Shooter. It's true. Well, I worked with Jim for probably close to 10 years back in the day, so you know, we go back a long way. We worked on a lot of different projects together, and it's a pleasure to do these public events with him. Great. Well, I can't wait to see him here. I'm going to have to check the schedule and check out the panel. Sounds good to me. Yeah, come and then they're free with your admission to the convention. So if you're anywhere near Reno, right Run, walk, fly, drive, teleport, do whatever you have to, get here. And, you know, if you're in L.A., that's less than a two-hour flight. Excellent. So start moving now. Listen to the man. Members of the Universe Army, it is day two of Wizard World Reno. And I have the privilege of starting my day by sitting next to the man, the myth, the legend, the comics great Jim Shooter. Good morning, sir. Welcome to Reno. Good morning. I thought you were talking about somebody else for a minute. There. Uh, well, I no, no offense to anybody here, but that would be very difficult. You actually got your start at a very early age, didn't you? I started when I was 13. I, I wrote a story and sent it in and exchanged letters back and forth, and eventually they bought that, and they bought uh, everything else I ever wrote. And this was DC Comics' Legion of Superheroes, correct? Yeah, it was Legion of Superheroes, which, uh, uh, Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes, which I read it, and I always thought they had great covers and stuff, but I thought maybe I could do a story that would compete with uh, what they had in there, and so that's why I picked that. You got success in the Legion, and then from there, a few years later, you actually ended up becoming editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics during, like, the late 70s and early 80s, correct? Yeah, well, I wrote a lot of stuff for DC. I wrote all the super titles. I just, I never 
Rule of Lois Lane, but I, everything else, Supergirl, Superboy. And I did that for a while, and then uh, I got a call from Marvel. They wanted an associate editor, which is like second in command of the editor in chief. Eh, that appealed to me, so I took that job, and then two years later, they hired me as editor in chief. Well, only two years? Wow. That seems like a big jump. Well, you know, it was an interesting job. Let's put it that way. At that time, they had gone through an editor in chief every few months. I mean, they, let's see, Roy was there for two and a half years. Uh, Len Wein was there for uh, eight months. Uh, Wolfman was there for almost exactly a year. Jerry Conway lasted three weeks. And then Archie Goodwin was there for 19 months. And then they, they ran out of live bodies. and they had to... <laughs> Who's left? Does Jim still have his sanity? All right, we'll give it to him. Yes. Your tenure as editor-in-chief, there's some monumental stuff. Under your watch, Marvel got the Star Wars license when it first came out. You got the license for G.I. Joe and Transformers, two of the 80s properties. I mean, I'm still a fan of Joe to this day. It was under your tenure that we had Secret Wars, the first and biggest crossover. We had some great runs like Burn on Fantastic Four, the Avengers run, X-Men, X-Men there you go, X-Factor. So what do you think of when you look back on your time as editor-in-chief? Well, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. The company was kind of a mess, and it was a real uphill battle trying to get things on time and straightened out and then get good people. And I, you know, raised the rates and then installed incentives and royalties and stuff like that. And we finally started getting back some of the people we'd lost and getting new people who were great and doing good stuff. i got to correct one thing. Roy Thomas is solely responsible for us getting Star Wars. I was there early on, but but he was the, the credit where credit was due. That's Roy. Okay. Very good of you to toss that to Roy Thomas. Great guy. Now, from Marvel in the 90s, you helped uh, launch Valiant. I didn't help. It was my company. Was my I founded it, okay. and uh, I built it and wrote almost everything and, and created. i got to say, I love that uh, you were able to get a hold of some of the gold key guys like Magnus and Solar. Well, the way that happened is interesting if you want to hear it. When I was at Marvel, we started doing too well. And because we were making so much money and doing so well, we became 70% of the market. We were just marching from victory to victory. Well, the board of directors decided this was an opportunity, and so they took the company private. That is, they bought up all the stock. And uh, they were in a position to depress the price of the stock, so they were able to get themselves a bargain. So they bought the company, and because we were doing so well, they figured they'd sell it. They'd flip it and cash out. They owned all the stock. They'd get all the money. So uh, for a year and a half, two years, uh, they were trying to sell the company, and a lot of times it didn't work out just because they were too greedy. But one guy who tried to buy it was the owner of a company called Western Publishing. Uh, the man's name was uh, uh, Bernstein, uh, um, and uh, he was interested in getting Marvel. He didn't know he owned any comic book properties. Well, when my wars with the people upstairs, you see, when a company's being sold like that, they usually are selling your rank and file, your staff down the river. So my choice was, I was the vice president. I could either join the bad guys, probably become rich, or I could become a labor leader and probably get fired. So I became a labor leader and I got fired. But before I got fired, uh, I was interviewed by Bernstein. As they always do this, they always interview top management when you're buying a company. It's called due diligence. He interviewed me several times. And also he was dealing with, you know, the, the other Marvel executives, none of whom had ever opened a comic book. Ugh. True. Absolutely true. Ugh. And uh, uh, so uh, he said to me, one of the nicest compliments I ever got from Bernstein, he said, he said, the more I think about it, he said, the more I realize I'm buying you and a bunch of used furniture. Oh, oh, oh. By me, Damn. he meant the creative guy. Yeah, yeah. But at any rate, uh, you know, that wasn't far from true. Well, after I got out of Marvel, I went to him and I said, you know, you own some comic book properties. He said, I did not know that. And I said, well, I can't license them yet. I don't have the money. I don't have a, a company. And he says, I'll hold them for you until you do. He held those for two years. He got offers from Marvel, from Dark Horse, from DC, because the industry was doing pretty well at that time and everybody wanted more properties. And he turned them all down. And he saved those properties for two years. And when I finally was ready, after I founded Valiant, me, and was ready to license the characters, I ran into him at the American Booksellers Association meeting. And I said, Richard, I'm ready. And he said, Pizers. Pizers was the name of his licensing guy. Pizers. He says, we're licensing stuff to this guy. He'll tell you what the deal is. Do anything he wants. <laughs> wow. And so I made them a fair deal. Wow. And, and, uh, and, and Pizers did anything I wanted. And, and so we had those characters to start with. That was nice. Something that I've noticed nowadays is that, for example, some of the stuff that was created during your tenure at Marvel, the alien symbiote costume, it became the villain Venom. Venom is still a part of the Marvel Universe. Also, this year, Marvel's been running an event that named after your 
seminal crossover event, Secret Wars. Have you had a chance to look at that? No, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> that's fine. That's they fine. Send, but they, they send it to me, but I haven't read it yet. That, that's fine. Well, I've, I've only read one of the crossover titles myself, but it was based off the X-Men cartoon in the 90s, which I love, so, you know, it, yeah. it, it was an easy draw for me. But what do you think of the fact that a lot of the stuff that was created during your time is still, like, a huge part of the Marvel Universe? Well, I mean, yeah, and of course not a lot of it was created by other people than me, but I think that's great, and I think that's a, that, that really is a sign that we, we really built a team there. We had, like, the who's who of editors. We had Archie Goodwin and Larry Hama and Louise Jones and, and uh, Louise Simonson. She became Louise Simonson. Yeah. And Nascenti. We had uh, uh, Danny Fingeroth, Carl Potts. We had a great lineup of editors, and, and, uh, and then... Like I said, we installed all these incentives and stuff like that, and we were able to get all the talent. We had Walt Simonson, and we had Claremont, and we had Byrne, and we had Miller, and we had Mazzucchelli, and we had Sienkiewicz, and just, just, you know, the who's who. Roger Stern, David Michelini. We had, like, oh, the man. who's who of comics. You had, you, you had an all-star team, sir. Well, you know what? Thank you for taking the time. Awesome. And you guys have been hearing from probably one of the biggest legends of comics, at least for myself growing up, but I'm sure there are a bunch of people who would agree with me. Thank you. Because you know it's it's it's. I don't yeah. have Netflix. Yeah, Damn. Well, no, I know. I no, I got it. Guys, we're but, back. But, but, but guys, Ash guys, versus back. Ash versus Army of Darkness is on, and that's the bomb, man. I want to see that too. We're back. Shoot, we're shoot back. Ask what y'all. Oh, hey, what's up, guys? We're back. We're back. We're back. We can talk about Jessica Jones and Ash versus Evil Dead later. Okay. Well, thank you, Ed, for that oh. Wizard World Reno report. We appreciate that. Uh, he was out there with Trish Helm and with Iggy Matthews of Let's Be Reels. Boy, that, that these are great conventions we get to do. And if there's a convention in your neck of the woods and you'd like us to participate in it, please contact Chris Harrelson at heroesonhand.com. And he'll take care of you. He's one of the walkers from The Walking Dead. And believe me, he's good. He's, he's Mr. October in the, mis- in the Walking Dead calendar. I don't know if that's as big as he can say. But he's, mis- he's Halloween Is he guy. wearing a shirt? He's Halloween guy. He, Halloween month guy in The Walking Dead. That, that is the page to be on, on in the calendar. And he's Mr. October. Uh, <laughs> guys, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget, go to our Facebook page, Marku42. Tweet us at Marku42. Go to Marku42.net and join the Hooniverse Army and read our news and get our podcast there, podcast version of this show. Don't forget... We are also available on TuneIn, Stitcher. We're at Geekcast Radio Network, FloridaGeekScene.com. Name a podcast platform, and I'll tell you if we're there. Come on, I, I dare you. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I didn't know there was a test. Wait, All right, but we're there. We're there. We're on almost. <laughs> you can. You can just do this. Your department. I don't. Yeah, know. We're, we're, we're. <laughs> It's so, like uh, me asking you, so Mark, what uh, what comedy clubs do you think I should perform at? <laughs> Well, I think you should perform at Madison Square Garden. There you go. That's my answer. And They're I'm booked. To it. I'm sick of it. <laughs> okay, everybody. And now, one last time, because the season's almost over. Next week is the last episode of the season. Your moment of Zen. The hybrid. I think it's time to tell the truth. I heard the doctor had come home. And so let's I'll say up to The hybrid is a creature thought to be crossbred from two warrior races. I know I went too far. You have broken every code you ever lived by. On my command! Is it true? She's my friend. Next team to Sector 52, Extraction Chamber 7, Regeneration in Progress. Presented by Mark Baumgarten, Christian Basil, Patty Hawkins, and Eduardo M. Pryor. This show was edited, produced, and directed by Mark Baumgarten. Please visit Marker42.net and register to join and be a part of the Universal Army. We could be 
contacted by email at mark at marku42.net. The subject line, question mark. If you have worked on Doctor Who or are working on a project relating to Doctor Who and want to be on our radio show, please email our media relations director, Christian Basil, at marku42media at yahoo.com. Doctor Who and its properties are owned by the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. This show is owned and copyrighted by Mark Baumgarten, 2015. You're listening to Krypton Radio.